Forgiveness, the exact same word as forgiveness. Here's the word remission. Let me erase this so I can start over. Okay, now. All right. Remission is the word A-P-H-E-S-I-S, Ephesus. And that word Ephesus means to pardon, pardon and release from prison. The Jews didn't have any prison sentences. They either had to pay money or they had to die or they had to make some kind of restitution. That was it. No prison sentences. How in the world, how'd they get in prison? Babylon. Babylon, they were taken into captivity. That was their prison. When they did something so bad, so wrong, went after God so long, God said, I'll carry you away into captivity. And he carried them over into Babylon. And that was their prison. Their turnkey was Nebuchadnezzar. Coming out of Babylon, they had to make a highway, a long highway up here, down to Israel. That's what John said. John came preaching in Luke the third chapter. John the Baptist came preaching the baptism of repentance as it was written in the book of Isaiah. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Make, make, make his path straight. Well, that was preached in the book of Isaiah concerning Israel being in prison. Notice how that ties with Acts 2.38 we're talking about. They were in prison in Babylon because they went after Baal in the grove or Hercules and Venus. The same thing as Mithra, whose birthday was December the 25th. Goodness, we're back there, aren't we? Back to Christmas already. Christ Mass. Baptism was getting them out of Babylon. They had to build a long highway to come back down here to rebuild the temple of God that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed in 586 B.C. That was baptism. That was repentance. They had to turn from Babylon. They had to turn from self or let us make us a name and come back home and rebuild the temple of God and we are the temple of God. No, you're not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Coming back and rebuilding the temple of God takes turning from self. That's what baptism is. John said Isaiah preached baptism, which was, and Isaiah said, prepare ye a highway in the desert for our God. That's what John the Baptist called baptism of repentance. Prepare a highway, come back to rebuild Israel after you've been carried into captivity. And that word forgiveness means to pardon and release from Babylon or from prison or from self. It's abstract language. It's figurative. Now, let's go over here to Acts 10. Acts 10. Now we've discussed a little bit. We haven't discussed it a lot. We've discussed ease, meaning to sink into clothing. Sink into clothing. And we've discussed epi, meaning to superimpose. Superimpose. And now we're going to look at en. Now, E.N., you remember we read in Mr. Mr. Strong's encyclopedia, he said that this particle is ambiguous, this word E.N., and he said it's usually, baptism is usually followed by E.N., baptized in. He says this word E.N. means with or by. When it's used with an infinitive, it means with or by. It does not mean to move into and come out of. It does not. Now, people can deal with that or not deal with it. It really doesn't matter. The authorities will tell you what it means. Now, let's read here in Acts, the 10th chapter. Peter has gone to the house of Cornelius. Cornelius is a Gentile. Oh, man, we got a real problem here, don't we? We got a Gentile. Up until the death of Jesus, if Cornelius being a Gentile, if he wanted to become a member of Israel or what was known as the kingdom, kingdom of God or slash heaven, 
kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. Now, when you get into dispensationalism, they'll tell you, well, you see the kingdom of God, that's the church, and the kingdom of heaven, well, that's a thousand years reign. A thousand years. And they don't know and they haven't studied that the rabbis, about 200 years prior to Christ, dropped the term God and inserted heaven because they didn't want to bring reproach upon that, word, upon that name God. Let me just show you that real quick. Okay? Look over here in Matthew, the fifth chapter. Quickly, we'll look at this, and then we'll come back to Acts 10. I want to show this to you and show you what it is. Now, Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 3. And also turn over here to Luke, the sixth chapter. I'm just going to show you this so you'll understand. And this has everything to do with baptism. Luke, the sixth chapter. Now, look here. I've got, got mine open, both spots. See, i got it like this, like that. So that way I can show you. Now, we're going to look here. Matthew 5 and verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, look over here in Luke 6 chapter in verse 20. He lifted up his eyes and disciples and said, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. That was Luke's way of putting it over here. One says kingdom of heaven, the other says kingdom of God. That was an old ancient term for Israel. Well, I guess it would be because the 12th chapter of 1 Samuel says God was their king when they asked for a man to be king over them. And where's the kingdom of God now? We are in the millennium now, except the word is not millennium. <laughs> y'all, man, English language needs to be kicked out. It's a harlot language. It sells out meanings. We're in the Kilia is what we're in, C-H-I-L-I. That is the word thousand. Thousand over there in Revelation 20, except it doesn't mean thousand. Not in the original Greek language. It means a multiple of thousand. It is plural. Plural. The Jews said one was not a number. One was not a number. One was a generator of numbers. Generator of numbers. Being a generator of numbers, they said that Two was the first number where they could call plural. And that any multiple of ten or a hundred or a thousand was a form of the original number. One thousand is a form of one. Kilia, being plural, being plural would mean two thousand or more. That's what it means. That always messed, played with my mind, and I'm not going through that. I just had to say that. Because we're in the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, right now. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom of heaven, right now, present tense. Look over here in Luke 17. Why are you saying this, Jim? I'm saying it. Look at Luke 17. Luke 17. Luke 17. Verse 20, And when it was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come. Now why are the Pharisees asking him this? Because during the time of Jesus, during the time of the Gospels, only southern Judah was back from the captivity. Only southern Judah was back from the captivity and Israel was not really Israel during the days of Jesus. It took the full 12 tribes, northern Israel, the 10 northern tribes had been carried captive, and they had not been given any decrees to come back. Northern Israel was led by Ephraim, the second born son of Joseph. Ephraim had the inheritance or the birthright. Therefore, the Jews said, if the one with the birthright wasn't home, that the household wasn't at home. They wanted to be delivered from the oppression of the Roman Empire who was killing and slaughtering them right and left. So they come to Jesus all the time and say, when are you going to restore the kingdom? If you're the Messiah, raise an army. 
And notice what Jesus says. <clears throat> Jesus said, and he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. When the kingdom of God comes, it won't be David riding or one of his descendants riding across a drawbridge out of a literal Jerusalem, riding over a moat with a big, big uh, uh, wall around it. He said it won't be like that anymore with David's descendants carrying the shield of David, the star of David on the front of it. Not anymore. He says, it, well, they won't say, lo, here it is, there it is over there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Israel will be in you. Well, wait a minute. If the kingdom of God, it actually says the kingdom, the God is in you in the original text. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And wherever the king was, they said the kingdom was consummate. That's where it was. Well, how did you get into the kingdom of God before Jesus died on the cross? If you were a Gentile. Huh? Baptism, circumcision. You had to have proselyte baptism. And what is Cornelius here in the 10th chapter? of? Gentile. He's a Gentile. If you were a Gentile, if you were a Gentile, here's what you had to do. You had to be, this was called proselyte baptism. You had to be circumcised. Then you had to be washed in water. And we read last week all those verses about the priests there in, in Leviticus 8 and in, in Exodus 30 and all through the Old Testament, how they had to be washed in water at the brazen sea right in front of the eastern gate of the tabernacle every morning. You remember that? They had to be washed. That was incorporated. That was an old priesthood. Priesthood. And here's what's amazing to me. All of the church historian will tell you it comes out of the washing of the priesthood. Well, what happened? Where'd that go to? I thought I had it over there. It was the two baptisms. Water. Water and Holy Ghost and fire. Well, what happened to this priesthood washing? It was nailed to the cross with Christ, Colossians 2.14. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances, didn't he? He blotted out the rituals. So you had to be washed, and they called that a new birth. And this was for Gentiles only. Gentiles only. Proselyte baptism, and then they had to offer two turtle doves. And this was the prescribed sacrifice for a new baby in Israel. All new babies had to have two turtle doves offered for them. They had to be circumcised on the eighth day. And they had to be washed, which they called a new birth. Now this is what frustrated Nicodemus. <clears throat> this about drove Nicodemus out of his mind right there. Because Nicodemus was very familiar with proselyte baptism. They were running around making proselytes. Did not Jesus say in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, looked at the Pharisees, and he said, you compass sin and to make one proselyte and after he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. He wasn't a very nice Jesus, was he? When he started talking about proselytes. And Mr. Lightfoot says, they had nothing for the proselytes. They were making proselytes for one reason. To get in their pocket. They had more money. They didn't care about proselytes. The Pharisees looked down on everybody, especially proselytes. They thought they were filthy. Trying to get into their pocketbook. In fact, let me come right back to this. Go over. This frustrated Nicodemus. Go to, let's go over here. Let's go over here to John 3. This is the verse that really frustrates everyone. Now, when, you are, when you're studying Bible, everything has to be translated in not only the Greek words. I had a Greek professor tell me one time, he said, you're going to find just as much truth in the context of Scripture as you are in the translation of the Greek words. You've got to stay in the context. And when I say that, what you have to do, you have to see who's being talked to, you have to see who's writing. 
what the purpose of writing is for, and how does it 